Hello, today's video is another entry in the series I am doing to publicize the 2022 conference of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. This conference is called SciCon and it'll take place in Las Vegas from October 20th to the 23rd, just like you can see over my shoulder. Uh, Dr. Natalia Pasternak is scheduled to appear at the conference this year and I'm happy to be able to talk with her now. Welcome and thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, Rob. For any viewers who don't know who you are, let me fill them in. Your bio on the SciCon website reads as follows. Natalia Pasternak is a science writer and microbiologist with a PhD in bacterial genetics from the University of Sao Paulo. Pasternak has brought crucial life-saving scientific information to millions of people in Brazil during the COVID-19 pandemic through her press columns, books, radio, and TV appearances. Pasternak is also founder and current president of, and I'm not gonna to try to say that in Portuguese, but in English, it's the Question of Science Institute. How do you say that in Portuguese? Instituto Questão de Ciência. A Brazilian nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of scientific evidence and public policies. Her book, Science in Our Daily Lives, co-authored with science journalist, Carlos Orsi, won the Brazilian Book Award for Best Science Book in 2021. Wow. And I believe you're also a recent fellow of CSI, is that correct? Yeah, ah, congratulations. congratulations, that was just after we met. And uh, you're the publisher of the only skeptical magazine in Portuguese, correct? What's that called? The only one in Brazil. I, I couldn't know if it's the, the only one in Portuguese. I hope there are some in other Portuguese speaking countries, but it has very originally the same name as the Institute. So it's Revista Questão de Ciência. We are, we are not very imaginative. <laughs> and is that roughly like the Skeptical Inquirer or like the Skeptic from Europe or, or Australia? It's very similar. It's a skeptic magazine, uh, a little bit more towards promoting scientific evidence for daily lives decisions and policy making, but it's very similar to the skeptic and skeptical inquiry. Okay. So I like to start off talking about your involvement with this year's SciCon. Uh, it's my experience that Ray Hall has always moderated the Sunday morning paper sessions, but this year he and you are both listed together as sort of co-moderators. I didn't see a title. So how did that happen? And uh, well, actually, before we answer that, maybe let's talk about what is the Sunday paper session, right? So yeah, so what is that all about? So the Sunday Papers is an attempt to bring more skeptics into the movement, people who are not uh, so well known into the community, but would like to contribute with their own work or research papers or either uh, books that they published, work that they, they have done in the past to promote skepticism. And we are trying, Red and I, to, to make it more international so that we can get people from other countries to come uh, it's so that we can really expand our skeptic community and not make uh, not remain so centered in the US and this is one of the reasons that Ray invited me since I'm I'm from Brazil and I can help him make it more international and broader and what we really wanted to do as well was to bring academics into the science papers we since we are both from universities we're both university professors we are both from academia and we know from experience that unfortunately Pseudoscience is still a thing inside academia in many, many countries, including my own. For instance, in Brazil, homeopathy is actually a, a medical specialty. So doctors, after going to medical school, they can specialize in homeopathy. And this means that homeopathy is taught in our medical schools in Brazil. So Ray and I wanted to try to bring more academics, more students really, undergrad and grad students to the Sunday paper so they, they can really be a part of the skeptic community. Ah, so, um, so for people who don't know anything at all about it, basically it's the last piece of SciCon. It's been that way for as long as I know about. Um, and it's on Sunday, hence the name Sunday morning paper session, right? So how does one apply and like what criteria should people follow to get a shot at being one of the speakers? 
So uh, on the website for the conference, for the SciCon, uh, you can find all the information about the Sunday papers, the form that you have, the, there's a Google form that you can apply. And it's really very simple. Uh, you just have to present an idea or a paper that you have written. It doesn't have to be peer reviewed paper or nothing like that. It's just in the format of a paper of an idea that you are using or have used to promote skepticism, to promote rational thinking, uh, to teach at the universities. There are several people this year, I'm very happy to, that we had a lot of submissions from professors who are trying to implement courses in their own universities about rational and critical thinking. So this, all these sort of things are really welcome to the Sunday paper session. Um, so as far as I know, only two people have ever presented at consecutive SciCon Sunday paper sessions. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Wikipedia article about SciCon includes this line. The 2019 Sunday paper session consisted of five presentations, including two given by speakers from 2018. And it turns out that you're one of those two people. You are also a regular. And I'm the other one, that's correct. We, we both did two in a row. Uh, yeah. And so that's when we met in 2019 and I interviewed you for the Skeptic Zone podcast about your talk. So please tell everyone about what your two Sunday paper talks were about. So they were mainly about skepticism in Brazil and the difficulty in promotion uh, of skepticism in Brazil. So in 2018, I talked a lot about the alternative medicine that we have. Uh, we have several, actually, we have 29 modalities of alternative medicine practices in our public healthcare system which we are very proud of in Brazil because we have a national public healthcare system that actually caters to 200 million people. So on one hand, this is something to be proud of in such a large country. On the other hand, it includes 29 modalities of alternative medicine that range from the most well-known ones as I said, like homeopathy and acupunctures, to things that I'm sure you have never even heard about, like circular dancing and family constellation. And really, you don't want to know, but it's 29 modalities. And in maybe, the maybe, I, maybe I do if we have time later. <laughs> Okay, maybe you, because you are very particular about wanting to know these kind of things, but it's it's really it's amazing how, how many weird stuff we have in the healthcare system and then in 2019 uh, i spoke about the institute question of science that we had just launched in brazil and the kind of work that we were doing with the institute to try to promote critical thinking uh, so and then the pandemic hit so <laughs> that was it <laughs> did you find the application process intimidating or was it straightforward to follow it is it really straightforward to, to follow? It's really easy to, 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 to follow the application. So I don't think that's going to be any problem. But anyway. How about, how about the, uh, the thing that hit me was you only have 10 to 15 minutes. And like, that's really short for a talk. Did you have trouble paring down your, your uh, material? Oh, well, I have some experience more now than I had at that time. But now I'm on TikTok. So I only have one minute and I really had to rely on my daughter for help. No, wait, didn't she tell you they uh, they changed, the, they increased the limit at least twice since I know about it. I think it's up to 10 minutes now. No, it's 15 minutes. Now. 15, there you go. The same as and, a Sunday and, paper limit. And really... 15 minutes for me, now that I'm on TikTok, 15 minutes is like an eternity. There's so much you can say in 15 minutes. I've, I've been doing, I'm, I'm part of a, a group sponsored by the UN that's trying to promote vaccine information on TikTok. And really it's one minute videos that you have to talk about vaccines. So it's it's wow. been a real challenge. And you have to edit the videos with all these kinds of animations and figures because it's for young people. So I had a lot of help from my 13 year old daughter. Otherwise I couldn't have done it. <laughs> okay, so Ray called you and said, hey, would you like to, uh, to get involved? Uh, so what are your responsibilities uh, this year? So uh, I'm co-hosting the Sunday papers with Ray. So that means that we'll be assessing all the applications together and choosing the, the three or four that are going to, to be presenting on Sunday. And 
And we are also hosting the session in a way that we, we hope to attract more people really to attend and to comment. And we hope to do something different this year as well, is that uh, according to the presentations and of course uh, if the if the presenters are willing we would like to help and really turn the session into a paper a peer reviewed paper and submit it to a peer reviewed journal because we really want to make it more academic and attract more academic so let's see if we can make that happen but it's an idea that we had that we we think maybe the participants would enjoy so in, in my experience, because it's scheduled for the final day, uh, only about half the conference attendees come to those talks in the past, right? The rest leave late Saturday after the main talks or early Sunday, I have an early Sunday flight and they totally miss out. So my suggestion is if you're going to come to this conference, plan to stay for the whole damn conference, right? Natalia, why should people stay a little bit longer, not miss the Sunday papers? because the sunday papers are amazing i mean it's it's usually people who don't have the opportunity to be on the main stage but they have a lot to contribute they have different stories they come from different backgrounds different nationalities and and really if you were the sunday papers in 2018 and 19 you probably saw uh things about brazil that you had no idea were happening or india i remember in, in 2018 uh, i was there from Brazil when there was this other presenter from India. So you get a broader perspective of what people are doing around the world that you had no idea about. And it's really interesting. It's really engaging. And I had some wonderful feedback from people in the audience who came to talk to me after the Sunday paper session and gave me ideas that I could pursue in Brazil. So it's really, it's worth it. It's a different part of the conference. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a really enjoyable experience being there and, and getting to know all these people. Yeah, thank you. So I want to point out to viewers that this interview, unfortunately, is going to be published after the uh, deadline to submit for this year. But this is an opportunity for every year. So maybe we don't have another catastrophic pandemic, which cancels the conference like it did the last two years. So plan ahead for next year, right? For anyone wanting even more information on this subject, there's an article I wrote called So You Want to Speak at SciCon? You can Google that. And it includes all sorts of insider details not available to all applicants. And in fact, when I... This, this video is going to be embedded in an article on Skeptical Inquiry Online, so I'll, I'll uh, include that link. Okay? Thanks. So let's talk about something else. In my recent video interview with historian of science, uh, Professor Naomi Oresis, I discussed the Netflix film, Don't Look Up. Uh, it's the apocalyptic satire from late last year. And her interest in this film was due to her involvement in teaching and writing about climate crisis, which Don't Look Up is actually an analogy for. Uh, for those who don't know about what this movie is about, it's about two scientists attempting to warn humanity about a comet that's on the course to destroy civilization. And the media, politicians, and the public, total disregard for this looming threat, right? Uh, so I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this film up with you. Why is that, someone might ask, right? Well, everyone, Natalia has been forever linked to Don't Look Up. I learned of this when I saw a meme. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen and show this meme. <laughs> oh my. Okay, so for people who haven't seen the movie, um, these are like nine of the major actors in it with their names up at the top. And if you notice in the first uh, row, middle column, instead of uh, <laughs> the actual actress's name, it says Natalia Pasternak. <laughs> and you're right next to the president. Bolsonaro, who is played by Meryl Streep, uh, right? And DiCaprio. So that's kind of an interesting position to be in. So um, <laughs> let's, let's talk about what that's about. Um, so you're being compared there to uh, Kate uh, DiBiaschi, and that's played by Jennifer Lawrence, who, and she went ballistic on a live TV show when the reporters interviewing her about the comments approach made light of the danger, right? Um, also, to explain this, let me read one little line from the Wikipedia article for the movie. One of the scenes in this film was compared on social media to a situation in Brazil. In that situation, microbiologist and science communicator Natalia Pasternak criticized a news report made by TV Cultura on a live broadcast in December 2022. So I've seen the video and that summary doesn't do it justice. So explain in your own words exactly what happened, please. 
Uh, I, I, I really, it must be the red hair. It's the only explanation. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what happened is that in December 2020, right before Christmas, I was a commentator, I'm still am, uh, at TV Cultura in Brazil. It's a TV station. And I'm, I'm usually a commentator at the evening news there. And they showed this piece about how you should deal with that relatives on Christmas dinner, Christmas Eve, that uh, didn't want to wear a mask and didn't engage in social distancing. And this was all before vaccination became available. So COVID was really, really killing people. And, so, and, and they were given these tips on how to behave with that relative that wouldn't wear a mask uh, and wouldn't observe social distancing rules in your Christmas dinner. And the, the piece was telling people to take it light and make jokes about it and do not engage in fights because you don't want to fight with your relatives and it's Christmas and it's all about love and sharing and you should really take this lightly and with humor and laugh about it. And I was like, what? People are dying. And, and you're telling people to, to take it light, to take it with humor, to make jokes about it. I mean, they'll be making jokes in their parents' and grandparents' funeral. Is that what you want? Because this, is, this has to be taken seriously. We're making an effort here as a science communicator so that people take it seriously. And then you come and say, take it lightly and with humor. So I really... Uh, uh, I said a lot of things live on television that I lost my patience, really. And it was very, <laughs> this is great. So there's the comparison when Jennifer Lawrence goes. Uh, yeah, that was the look on my face that was when the look I was on your watching <laughs> the, the news piece telling people to take it lightly. And, and then I, I, so I spoke my mind as I usually do. And, and then when I saw the movie for the, for the first time, it was really funny because I, I watched the movie, I saw that scene when the, when the, the character of Kate Dibiaski loses patience live on television. And, and I told my husband, wow, I would never lose my patience on TV <laughs> like that. <laughs> So it was, and then when when the movie stopped, it was already on Twitter. So I went to check my Twitter, and people had already made a comparison. They had my video. They 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 had my video from that night on the evening news, and they were already comparing it to the movie and making memes and all that. And I realized that it, it was it was really funny because it was a very very similar scene. And how, really, how, how widely was that reported on besides oh, just like Twitter? Oh, I think it went really viral. I saw it in all kinds of social media and on media itself, on the regular media too, on the press. They caught it, they, they, they made fun of it on television, but it was good fun. I mean, we all laughed together, but I think we all learned from that situation that some, some things are really not to joke about or to take lightly because people were dying. It was a very serious situation. And yes, sometimes scientists lose their patient on national television. Scientists are people too. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you think the folks responsible for the film ever heard about this? I don't think so. It's a Brazilian thing. Uh, I, I, I don't think they, they even know what, ha what happened there, but but at least we, we, we had some fun and I think it's a really good movie. I think that the message is really good. Uh, the, the movie is fun, it is entertainment, but it has a very clear message that cannot be ignored. And people, if you watch it, don't shut it off when the credits start to roll. It's like the Marvel movies. There's two post-credit scenes, which are very <laughs> important. Yeah. I can't believe how many people told me they watched the movie and they didn't know that it was. The, ah. the film. And then they went back and watched the end of it. So while watching the movie, by the way, I took it as a parody of 
the insufficient reaction to the COVID pandemic. But I read that the script predated the pandemic and was actually an allegory for climate change. So it's kind of interesting because, of, and it was actually, the movie was delayed, I think, because it took longer to make it because the pandemic had started. And then when it was released during the pandemic, everyone just assumed, oh, this is about the pandemic because it fits so closely. It's amazing that it could fit more than one thing going on at the same time. But yeah, it really, ugh. Yeah, oh, because, all right. this untie, because this anti-science movements, they are very much alike in strategies that they use for miscommunication and disinformation. So I think it, it really fits. It fits all kinds of anti-science. Yeah, I talked about that with Naomi. Like she wrote the book, I think it's called Merchants of Doubt, which is all about the tobacco industry and even the same people yep. went into, you know, disputing the science facts on, on the other things that come up. Yeah. So changing topics again. Um, one of my two Psychon Sunday paper talks was about the danger in believing in psychics. And that included horror stories of victims taken for their life savings by psychic scammers. And I only talked about US cases because that's all I hear about here. But as a coincidence would have it, the detective I've reported on in that presentation, uh, and he's the one who gets justice for victims of these types of crimes, Bob Nagar, sent me the story just the other day uh, about a woman in your country who was scammed out of an astronomical sum. Uh, have you heard about this? What, what do you know about this? It's all over the news in Brazil and it was huge and it's not that common or I don't know, maybe it doesn't get reported that, that often. I'm suspecting but... that's the case. Unless the numbers are big and newsworthy, like if you lose 20, 10, 30,000 equivalent US dollars, the news might not even care about it. Yeah. I think this was the case. And, and for me, if you asked me, I would say that, well, no, this is a US thing. It doesn't really happen in Brazil. So I was really surprised to see that not only it does happen, but the amount that 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 was scammed out of that lady. So and what was uh, what was that amount? Oh, I don't remember now, Rob. Sorry. I have to look they report, I think it was in the hundreds of millions but i'm not sure if I, that was i think currency. so because it in, it included works of art and and very very expensive stuff but uh it, it was quite a surprise that it made the news in brazil so i think it was because of the amount that was really impressive uh, because it's not usually a thing here and it's not as i said we, for in the in my institute for instance the institute question of science we are usually much more worried about public policies for health and education that are not science based but we don't look so deep into this kind of fraud and scams and maybe we should, because maybe they are just not in the news, but they are happening. So yeah, that's one of the things I talked about in regards yeah. to the problem in America. So uh, the detective Bob Nygaard is the only one I'm aware of in the US who deals with this kind of problem. So if you're a victim and you happen to be lucky enough to Google the problem to find his name. So the thing is though, he gets, he tells me four or five contacts a day asking him for help. And he's not an agency, he's one person. I mean, he wow. can't. And that's you know just a number of people who first off want to come forward. A lot of people are too embarrassed and don't, right? Who who yeah. are afraid to come forward because this is a kind of a seedy industry. If you want to you know confront them directly, um, and or, or who you know even find that there's someone you can call besides going to the police. People go to the police stations. They go, no one put a gun to your head. That's not a crime. So it, it's not taken seriously. Or prosecutors don't want to bring it to trial because they got other bigger problems or they think a jury is going to let the, the guy off anyway, because they're going to say no one put a gun to your head. So I've always wondered how big a deal this is in other countries, because the same thing, if you looked at US papers, you don't hear about this a lot. It, it, it's only when they hit a, a millions of dollars that it hits the newspaper. Not, I got a, a, an email from a woman who lost $40,000. It was her entire life savings. That didn't make the papers. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's very unfortunate. So my bet is it's not limited to only a few countries, which is really a shame. Where, where do you think Brazil stands to other nations regarding just general pseudoscience and paranormal beliefs? So uh, we took a survey with the Institute in 2019 and Brazil is really big on pseudoscience for health. As I said, in our public healthcare system, we have 29 modalities, but Brazil is not that big on climate change issues. For instance, most of the population agrees that climate change is real and is man-made. 
and vaccines are still uh, reliable in, in, in Brazil. I mean, people really rely on vaccination for COVID now, although we had some hesitancy and some resistance, but we have over 80% of the population at least vaccinated with two doses. We are getting some difficulty getting the third and fourth dose, but two doses, we have over 80% of the population oh, vaccinated. Fantastic. And this is what Brazil is, is usually like for vaccines. We are a country very used and very favorable to vaccination. But for all the kinds of pseudoscience in health, then we endorse a lot of pockery. So homeopathy, acupuncture, uh, laying of the hands, spiritual beliefs, spiritual healing. We have it all. And I think this is a big problem in Brazil that really has to be solved. What about conspiratorial thinking? That's the other thing the Skeptical Inquirer often writes about. I think it's all over, really. It's become more of a thing now during the pandemic. And I think it was really uh, enhanced by the president's attitude. So now I think we're having a little of conspiracy theory into vaccination and, uh, and also about climate change and environment. But be, uh, I think this, is, this has gotten worse during, during Bolsonaro's government, really. I remember in the beginning, uh, the little bits I saw on our media about him was he was going around like without a mask, taking selfies with people, uh, yep. and and that's and then I related that to you know Trump's kind of dismissal early on, especially in, you know I didn't I didn't so I'm I'm really glad that the Brazilian people at least didn't go with that. And we're in this country, it's still atrocious. Like if whenever they do surveys politically, it's like the huge majority of Republicans like you know are not vaccinated. They think it's some kind of a conspiracy. And of course, there are some Democrats because they're maybe anti-vax for other reasons, like, you know, it's not natural and things like that, but it's not a political thing. So, so I guess Bolsonaro wasn't able to politicize it then, is my interpretation. I think not to the same extent as in the US, but he was, because whatever hesitancy we have in Brazil now with vaccination is because of Bolsonaro's government. We didn't have it before him. So we were a country with like 95% vaccination rates. And, and now, for instance, of course, we had the pandemic, so it's not just about trust. We had some logistic issues that every country had, but our polio vaccination in 2021 was 67% which for Brazil standards is really, really low. We never, it was never below 90, never in like 40 years of vaccination. So what was unique about that situation? What caused that? I think it's a mixture of factors as it usually is with vaccination. It's not uh, straightforward. So I think uh, the pandemic had its toll, of course, so people stayed home and they didn't have a time or they didn't want to take their children to the vaccination centers and, and and mind you vaccination in brazil is free and available for everybody in the healthcare system so we have a we have one of the best public immunization programs in the world so all vaccinations not just covid and covid the, no, the us is the only one you can get for free all vaccinations we have a very thorough very complete vaccination system especially for children so uh, all vaccines are free and, and even so, people stopped vaccinating during the past few years to a point where polio vaccination reached this 67%, which for our standards is frightening. It's really low. And, and of course, I think trust has been affected too because of Bolsonaro and the Minister of Health raising doubts about vaccination safety and logistics too. So we stopped campaigning vaccinations need campaign you cannot bring people to the vaccination centers without campaign without publicity campaigns and bolsonaro cut the budget for that so we, we didn't have a, we have we haven't been campaigning for vaccines since 2018 okay so uh, what's your institute's role in this battle well, it's a difficult road because we try to really uh, 
create awareness in the population as to why these topics are important. So vaccine and the public health care system and using evidence, using scientific evidence. And at the same time, we try to press government members, parliament members to really use scientific evidence for laws and regulations. And of course, during this government, which is an anti-science, anti-education, anti-health, anti-everything, uh, government, it became really, really difficult because it's difficult to talk to politicians now. It's, uh, it's in, in this way, it's very similar to the US. The country is really divided, really polarized, and it's election year. We are going to vote for president now in October, and we hope that it's the end of Bolsonaro, but we still have some time to see. Well, it might be like in this country, right? He could run again, even if he's not elected this time. Just like oh a, yeah he can if okay, it's not so, arrested uh, <laughs> all right so back to sidecon for a few final questions uh what are you looking forward to most about attending this year besides the sunday papers of course which are going to be involved oh i see a lot of new speakers that uh i've never seen on stage for instance naomi oreskes is someone that i really admire i read all her books and i'm really anxious to see her talk she was great uh, to talk to yeah, Nick Taylor to uh, uh, about exercise and myths and exercise, it, it, which is a field full, really full of myths that people really believe in. So I'm really anxious to see his talk. I think we, we have a whole range of new speakers that are, I'm really anxious to see. And Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And of course, the keynote speaker. And we have uh, another keynote speaker this year that I'm very proud to say I brought, uh, who is my colleague at Columbia University, Professor Stuart Firestein. He's going to speak on Sunday together with the Sunday paper so that maybe we can get people ah. to stay. And Stuart is going to talk about his books on ignorance and failure as part of the scientific process. So I think it's going to be very interesting. I, I heard his talks already, of course, so I can say that it is really interesting. And please stay for the Sunday so that you can see Professor Firestein and the Sunday papers. Yes, absolutely. OK, I think that's a good place uh, to call it here. Uh, it was so great to be able to talk with you again. Thanks so much for your time. And I hope we meet in real life once more in Vegas this year. Thank you, Rob. My pleasure.